So let me thank very much for being invited uh, here. Um, I want to tell you about uh, quantum computing and actually how to build a quantum computer. Uh, this is a journey that for me personally started now almost uh, 30 years ago. You know, I was in a, in a talk at a conference and I heard that if you had uh, a quantum computer, it would be much more powerful than the classical computers that we have uh, at the moment. And uh, the question of the person giving the talk was, well, we just had first quantum algorithms uh, invented, you know, but uh, how do we build a quantum computer? And this, for me, personally started a journey, a journey sort of as somebody coming from quantum optics, atomic physics, where we started out with some theoretical ideas, but now 30 years later, we're at the point where I guess I can show you certain results that, you know, Quite a lot has been happening and would, uh, would like to give you kind of a snapshot you know, where we are at the moment. Uh, let me also emphasize that, of course, in talking about these things, that's a wonderful example where we go from basic uh, quantum science or basic science to something that becomes uh, a quantum technology. Uh, quantum technologies, then, of course, the hope is to have then also an economic impact, a social impact on the society. But as a scientist, of course, I'm particularly interested also in the fact that we develop new tools that at the end come back to science and, uh, you know, help us maybe in some new discoveries. And I think that, you know, all of these quantum computing ideas of building a quantum computer is very much uh, along these kind of lines, as you will see hopefully now in the following. Uh, so you might actually wonder, you know, what this thing over here is. Uh, this is an iron trap that I will explain now in the following. It exists in the lab of my experimental colleague. I'm a theoretical physicist, you know, that thinks about these things. And I would like to tell you this story about, you know, building quantum computers and simulators with atoms and ions. And I would say that historically this is very interesting because if you go 30 years back, what we learned at that point from our experimental colleagues in atomic physics is they could take single atoms or ions and they can store them in free space and you know, hold them in traps that could be laser traps, could be uh, electromagnetic uh, traps, and you could use laser light to cool them down to a very, very low temperature. So there was the point where one was able to prepare and manipulate single atoms. And uh, sort of the question that was, and quantum computing is this problem to take single atoms, but now build up very complex many body systems and engineer their interactions. This is really what we do when we talk about quantum computing. The whole story, of course, goes back really to Feynman in 1983, who gave a talk uh, at the conference, you know, pointing out that we should actually build quantum devices. He was talking much more about quantum simulators, and I will talk about these things now in the following that, you know, that we build devices to solve quantum mechanical problems. So let me give you sort of a very elementary hands-on explanation of how these quantum computer of trapped ions work and we are going then to move over to the application. So what you can see is exactly what I was talking about before. We have here a trap that's an ion trap and we have down here a row of atoms that you can see here and these are really single atoms or single ions that are suspended in vacuum and uh, the form here is string. And you should sort of think about each of these atoms having internal uh, levels. And you might say, well, uh, there could be an electron in the outer shell that's maybe spin up, another one spin down. And you might say, well, that's great. So we have at the moment something like a classical memory. We can store, you know, spin up and spin down. And this would be zeros and one. And because we could put all of them up, all of them down or whatever, uh, quantum mechanically, of course, what's happening, and this makes sort of the quantum computer powerful, and this is really the point behind the story, is that all of these uh, configurations that we have classically are present at the same time in the wave function. This is what we call entanglement. And the reason why I'm not writing out all of these terms over here is that if I give you n of these qubits, it takes two to the n configurations that you have in there. So we have something that we call in quantum mechanics uh, entanglement, and this sort of, you know, entanglement is really the reason behind the power of why at the end we believe that these quantum computers are more powerful than their classical counterparts. And so sort of this is what Schrodinger called the Schrodinger cat. We have, you know, uh, the living cat and the uh, dead cat at the same time. So, well, here we are building a Schrodinger cat out of our quantum register that we have down here. The question is, of course, we not only want to think about entanglement, you know, and store it, we also would like to manipulate it. So how do we manipulate these things? This is the question of building quantum gates or manipulating entanglement. 
Of course, for the ions, I show you here, uh, you know, this is a, a Wigner crystal. The ions repel each other, and of course, they can sort of oscillate in space. This motion is in principle quantized. Here you see the classical motion to make it sort of visible over here. But you can see that all of these ions here oscillate. Uh, and if you cool down to very low temperatures, you know, this motion is quantum mechanically. We have quantized phonons. This is a quantum degree of freedom. And by sort of using internal spins, you know, and then writing them over to the motion, all of that, you can build what we call quantum gates that allow you to basically manipulate you know, the entanglement. You can really program the entanglement that you would like to have. This is the physical idea. And if you want to see some equations down here, these would be the qubits, the quantum bits, you know, spin up and spin downs, and the phonons. And we have a huge superposition state that we can manipulate using, for example, laser light as uh, indicated over here. So where are we now at the moment? Well, you know, 30 years ago, we came up with ideas that if you give us a quantum circuit like the one over here that t tells us how to shine laser pulses on the particular ions, you know, uh, in the context of ions, you would shine laser pulses here, maybe from there, and then also if you read out by something that we call quantum jumps at the end of doing a quantum computation, you know, asking is the spin up or down or is it zero or one? And we are presently at the stage of being able to do these operations for maybe a few hundred of these gates, you know, then it falls apart and we have to do error correction, but I will say at the end that we are very close to doing error correction in uh, these machines at the moment to make it really scalable to much uh, larger devices. So this was uh, the original ideas, and uh, if you want to go see the lab of my colleagues in Innsbruck, this is the Iron Trap lab. This is actually a 51 qubit programmable quantum simulator. I will tell you a few examples of what we're doing at the moment in the lab to, uh, together with my experimental friends in this whole context here. And uh, I would say that the exciting thing for us at the moment as theorists is that 30 years ago, we invented these devices, and our experimental colleagues were sort of you know, good enough to build these things in the lab. But now these devices are coming back to us as theorists, and we can finally play with them in the way that we had sort of envisioned, you know, in the first place when we thought about these things now 30 years ago. And uh, the way how this is done, you know, now for 51 qubits that I'm down here, has to do with the fact that, you know, in Innsbruck we have here our Academy Institute, and this is the university. And uh, in this institute, I mean, we have here these two buildings. And uh, the experimental friends like Rainer Platt and so on, uh, they built on one hand, you know, these quantum computers. For example, in this case, it would be a 26 qubit device. On the other hand, it may be one of these uh, specialized you know, processors like 51 qubits that I'm indicating down here. And we as theorists you know, are able to sit now in, uh, in our offices over here and sort of control this machine. So we're able to start some simple computations, make a readout, you know, go back and so on. And this is sort of the playground that we have established. So it's sort of like having a little quantum internet available in our university that allows us to play with these kind of devices. So at that point, you might sort of ask, I mean, what should we do? And of course, there's a lot of ideas out there in terms of possible quantum algorithms. I have to say that being a physicist myself, I'm most interested in applying, of course, these new quantum machines that we have to real physics problems. And uh, of course, the, the many body problem is uh, sort of one of them. And uh, so it is very clear that we can, for example, uh, develop such uh, machines here as a special purpose uh, quantum computers, as you will see now the following, that I maybe don't have the complete instruction set. Uh, but they allow us to solve certain problems that we find, for example, interesting. And these could go from uh, design new quantum materials, and I will give you a sort of a fundamental version perspective now in the following. Uh, we can talk about, I don't know, uh, if you are a chemist, you might be interested in designing new drugs. Maybe these quantum devices eventually will allow us to solve then complicated chemistry problems. Or, or may, might also think about high energy physics. We have done some toy simulations of, um, for example, uh, abelian lattice gauge theories to sort of demonstrate toy problems in this whole context. Uh, so let me now sort of be a little bit more specific. You can see these are a postdoc of mine, student of mine, sitting together with the experimentalists in the lab. And we are sort of at the point now that we as theorists can develop codes that we can directly run on these quantum machines. Of course, you know, in synergy with our experimental friends. And this is the experimental student here in the middle, you know, writing down circuits to do certain things and so on. And this is from a paper now uh, a few years ago uh, that was 20 qubits. Now we are up to 50 qubits. And let me give you now examples of what we're able to do. And this is now really from our last publication that we submitted um, a few months ago. And it will 
uh, come out very soon in the journal that one is never allowed to mention before it comes out. Uh, basically, this has to do with, you know, we take a model, for example, like uh, what we Heisenberg model, sorry for this slide being a little bit more, more technical, that we write down on a piece of paper and then the question is, can we design quantum algorithms that we can run on the quantum machine that prepares the ground state of this particular Hamiltonian, you know? And that's of course, you know, all of these quantum mechanical many body problems, this is what this thing is really about. Then we go uh, sit down and devise certain circuits, you know, that we implement on the quantum machine. We have then, you know, in this case, it's a hybrid quantum uh, classical algorithm. So this means that we are running, you know, uh, a class of variational wave functions on the quantum machine that at the end is sort of more effective than the classical counterpart. And here you can see what we achieved, namely that the energy is sort of in this quantum circuit finally going down. And to just give you a feeling of what we achieve here, uh, is, uh, you know, we have 51 qubits, so if I have a Hilbert space which is 2 to the power of 51, you know, that's about 10 to the 14, we're able to prepare approximate ground states that are down there, uh, about 300 uh, ground states, I mean, the, the 300 lowest levels, this is the approximation that we get. So it's amazing what we're able to do at the moment uh, with these machines uh, in, in the lab, how well they work. And this is sort of really, I mean, I just want to show you that you know, this is an indication of the last paper that we wrote in this context. You take this Heisenberg model, you know, you would like to find entanglement properties, for example, of ground and excited states that would, in technically speaking, correspond to an area law or volume law over here. We devised a certain quantum algorithm to prepare these ground states and also then certain algorithm to investigate all of that. And I think that the only take home message for you at the moment here is this, that we can still simulate at the moment, you know, for 51 qubits, many of these calculations that we're trying to do, but very soon we are at the point where we can no longer do that. But at the moment when we do our classical simulations and our quantum computations, the agreement is actually pretty good in the whole context of here. So that's quite amazing how these things work. So. Uh, don't take, don't try to understand the details here. The take-home message is simply that, you know, uh, it actually works. It seems to work uh, what we're trying to do here. But let me now go back and become again a little bit more qualitative and ask, you know, what the future will be in all of that. Um, and I think that the big challenge is, is when we have all of these different versions, I told you about ions, but we also have superconducting circuits, quantum dots, and of course, neutral atoms. I will talk more about these things, photons as possible other platforms to develop all of these ideas. But sort of the fundamental challenge that we are facing in this context is really the fact that on one hand, we would like to control large scale quantum mechanical system down to the last quantum mechanical degree of freedom, while at the same time, you know, scaling it up to very large particle numbers and isolating our system, you know, from the environment. And uh, this challenge, you know, of scaling up, this is, I think, what sort of the next generation is. And let me show you a few ideas that, again, we developed on the, on the theory side here, uh, actually 20 years ago, that are now becoming realities in the lab and that address this problem of scalability. So the big problem is, you know, can we scale up to more than 100 and maybe even 1,000? And um, the schemes that I'm going to show you now, the following actually correspond to about 1,000 of these qubits uh, in the lab based on uh, the so-called Rydberg atoms. So. so the basic idea of what one tries to do over here at the moment is that one does sort of tweezers in atomic physics. I guess many of you are familiar in biology that I can take focused laser lights and I can grab you know, individual cells and move them around. You can do the same thing also with an atom and you can, for example, try to catch a single atom into the focus of a laser light that we call here a tweezer. And if you try to do these things many times, well, once in a while you're successful, sometimes not, and so on. But what you can do now, and this is uh, of remarkable elegance, but at the same time it sounds almost trivial, we can look, you know, where, where is an atom and we can move the other ones. These are sort of independent laser beams together to form now again a quantum register. And you can see that over here, if these are the initial arrangements in 1D, this is sort of the rearranged ones, so you can extract entropy from the system by simply playing the Maxwell demon. You know, you look at it, where these things are, and then you can rearrange. And if you give your experimental friends, uh, uh, you know, buy them a beer, they can even print your name uh, with this whole thing over here. So these are really individual atoms that you can arrange at any will that, uh, that you would like to in free space. The question is, of course, how do you make these atoms that are typically in our distance of about maybe 10 micrometer apart, how do you make them interact? And the idea that we had, uh, 20 years ago, together with Misha Lukin, 
uh, was that uh, why not take, for example, these atoms and excite them to Rydberg states, you know, very high-lying atomic states. These high-lying atomic states, uh, they scale in size, like n squared, n being the principal quantum number, and we can easily go up to Rydberg states of about, I don't know, 50 or maybe even 100, where the atom becomes so big that it's almost, you know, comparable to a, to a um, I don't know, virus, for example, you know? Of course, these atoms that we excite to the Rydberg states, they will interact strongly, and we can control this interaction with the laser light, and this is what I mean by the interaction over here. And uh, this is happening at the moment in the lab, in the large scale. One learned how to do these kind of interactions, you know, this engineering of entanglement, why these Rydberg interactions. And let me just point out this figure that we have over here, that, for example, uh, you have now this array of these atoms over here, each of them representing a qubit. But what you can do now is this, that you can take these laser beams and you can move these atoms around in the will. You know, and uh, so this leads to, and this was an idea that we had uh, published a long uh, time ago here, you know, this leads to what you can see in the right lower corner. This is a quantum computation going on where each of these individual atoms that you can see over here correspond to one qubit, but you can try to make now quantum computations by moving these atoms in parallel around. You know, they come together, they're doing a gate, then you move them and running a whole quantum algorithm. And the great thing is that this thing being in 2D or then also 3D, that, uh, you know, that this scales to a very large particle number. So experimentalists at the moment are able to do these things for a few hundred and now even up to 1,000 atoms. And this is the point where, of course, it gets uh, rather interesting because this is what you need if you want to think about serious applications. So this is this, um, you know, Rydberg uh, ideas here. And uh, let me just mention also that, you know, um, the big challenge, of course, in the future will be um, you know, these are still analog devices and they make uh, errors. You know, we have to make a digital quantum computation out of an analog computation and we have to introduce error correction. But I would say the big advances that are happening right now at the moment in the lab, and this is sort of like a new era coming, will be that, uh, you know, there will be fault tolerant quantum computing coming and we see early incarnations in the lab where you can do error correction on the large scale so that errors that occur due to decoherence or lack of control, you know, that you have, um, that you can do quantum computations and correct errors and then really sort of at the end uh, lead to something that fulfills the promise that we have in, um, in actually building uh, quantum computers on the larger scale. Until we are there of really solving chemistry problems and so on, it will take a very long time, but I would say that the progress is quite amazing. And um, the goal, of course, is fault-tolerant uh, quantum computation. Let me sort of uh, conclude uh, my story over here with the following remarks that we have not only thought about, of course, building individual quantum computers, in particular since we have incarnations here using atoms and, and ions uh, interacting with laser light, uh, there's a very natural interface to photons. And so this idea of building a quantum internet and having sort of a stationary qubit like atoms interfacing with flying qubits that are, uh, you know, for quantum communication, for example, this is again a reality, and we have in Innsbruck at the moment a situation where we have two trapped ion quantum computers sitting in two labs that are 250 meters apart. There's a fiber link in the middle, and we can send you know, quantum su uh, superpositions or qubits via photons you know, over to the other computer and vice versa. And so there's this whole era of, on one hand, networking quantum computers coming, you know, where you can network quantum computers to make them larger. And on the other hand, of course, this leads then to, for example, uh, maybe uh, communication over large distances using purification protocols that we know how to run on these kind of devices. So this is a promise that um, is sort of happening again at the moment. Uh, the problem under quote behind it is that many of these operations are still quite slow and you have to speed them up, but uh, at least uh, they seem to be uh, working. And so. Is, uh, is sort of this vision of this, you might call it quantum internet. And of course, the great thing, if you think about intercontinental um, you know, uh, sending of quantum information, that this is this security uh, guaranteed by the laws of quantum physics, which underlies here, um, for example, the, the quantum communication part. Um, so let me sort of conclude here by simply saying that I think we live in interesting times where we have on one hand, basic science, you know, we talk about things like entanglement that are very, you know, uh, foundational to quantum mechanics and their studies. 
and we just had a Nobel Prize, you know, that was given for the study of entanglement. Uh, but now we learned how to manipulate this entanglement and use it in order to build now computers that are much more powerful than the classical computers. And so there's this, you know, basic science leading to applications. Uh, and then finally to a quantum technology. Uh, but I would say that the most interesting part for me is this, that, you know, once you have quantum technology and think about atomic clocks that work now, you know, to 10 to the minus 21 uh, uh, um, uh, precision, that if you, for example, use this entanglement and you fly now interferometers via satellites in free space, this may be an interesting way of then getting, for example, you know, gravitational waves on the, on the different scale, adding to what's happening at the moment, also this notion of entanglement and engineered entanglement to build, for example, large scale interferometers. And so in this sense, this maybe at the end feeds back to basic science as something that will allow new discoveries. And this is really what I would say physics is all about. And I conclude here by just saying that the uh, big lab that you showed before now can be put into a, to a single rack over here, with just lasers and all of these things. So you can actually buy these kind of machines right now. And of course, it might also be available on different platforms. I want to conclude by just showing from uh, Julia, who is now at Harvard, you know, from Florence originally, you know, these uh, nice movies about these moving atoms. They're very entertaining. They don't have a deeper meaning. You know, you can see that these are the atoms and they can move around in free space. This, if these are qubits, they can do quantum computation. And uh, you have even here a, a Mario movie, okay? So no deeper meaning behind it, but I think fun. But really, we want to make these things quantum compute, and this is what's happening at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you.